Our scripture reading is found in Genesis chapter 12, and we will be beginning in verse number 1. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word. And may we find in it a word that is to us and for us on this day. I am aware that what I just read is not what you were handed as you walked in the door, <laughs> just in case you are wondering, but we'll get to that in a minute. Also changed the title of this sermon since it went out in our e-blast earlier this week. We will know it today as six words and a comma. Depression. Grief. Dark nights of the soul. If you are a visitor, I would want you to know that's not where we usually begin. These are things that are not spoken of often behind pulpits, but they need to be. I agree with Anne Lamott when she described the way she imagines Jesus feels when we make changes or when we grow. This is how we make important changes, she wrote, barely, <laughs> poorly, Slowly, and yet still when we do, Jesus raises his fist in triumph. I have easy news for you and challenging news to share. Which would you like first? <laughs> okay, I'm going to share the easy news first. There are any number, a myriad of ways that we might grow and make changes in life. The challenging news is this. After a certain point in life, and for the record, most of us have passed it, the bulk of the growth we are going to experience happens smack dab in the middle of depression and grief and the dark nights of the soul. The most significant new beginnings which we will experience as human beings are going to look first a whole lot like an ending. The most important and soulful new paths that we will take as people will come when it looks a whole lot like there is no way forward. When green shoots of new life spring up within us, it will happen most often when something inside us, some dream, some hope, something inside us has died. Often in church, we talk about reaching for new heights. Today, we're going to talk about the depths. And to do that, I think we need to begin with prayer. Pray with me. Lord, just as we are, though tossed about with many a conflict and many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, together we come. Just as we are, Lord, Thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise, Lord, we believe. 
O Lamb of God, we come, we come. Amen. It is Women's History Month, and we will make our way to the recognition of that in different ways throughout this month. But it seems a fitting time for me to tell you a story about my mother. And in so doing, I'm going to be telling you something about me. Depression accompanied my mother throughout the course of her life, sometimes in a debilitating fashion. Uh, her siblings have shared with me that it was evident even in her very early life. I can speak of it freely from the pulpit with good conscience because she spoke of it freely and openly. And because she spoke of it freely and openly, she came to be the helper of many of those who suffered from the same malaise. Wherever we were, we moved about, but wherever we were, broken people found her. We never knew who was going to be at the dinner table at the end of the day. They found her in her, in her own woundedness. She found a way to help them. I am my mother's son, and it would have taken a great stroke of luck or blessing, however you understand those sorts of things, to have missed out on the genetic path which depression often takes. I was not that lucky, and it has accompanied me at places in my journey. Mom encouraged me to be as free as she was in talking about it. I have not been. I was too much of a coward. I was too paralyzed by some condition fueled probably by testosterone. Yeah, <laughs> gets in the way of a lot of stuff. Pride and an insecurity that anybody who knew that I struggled in that fashion would lose confidence in me. And Lord knows we couldn't have that. There have been periods in my ministry, I confess to you, that I've been struck by the awareness as I began the invocation on Sunday morning that it was the first time I had prayed since the benediction that I closed a service with before. And it wasn't that I was angry with God or being willfully defiant. It just felt to me in those moments that to lift anything, including a prayer, was too much. Depression, grief, dark nights of the soul. I'm not here to bring you down. I promise I'm not. I'm here to let you know that I know, and I know that you know that to live means to sometimes be accompanied by the darkness. And that, that darkness sometimes becomes our teacher. But still, I'm not here to bring you down. I promise I'm not. I'm here to share with you what my old professor, Dr. Sam Ballantyne, said were the, were the greatest most significant words of good news in all of the Bible. They're found right here in today's text. Six words and a comma. Now the Lord said to Abram. I get it. That hasn't knocked your socks off yet, has it? Sounds like a pretty, pretty garden variety way to begin a, a, a sentence of, uh, of Scripture. Now the Lord said to Abram, I gave you something today, and I've been hoping you're at least asking why. By now you likely know that you're holding a genealogy, although you may still be asking why in the world am I holding a genealogy? It is one of those sections, it's in the 11th chapter of Genesis, one of those sections that even serious students of the Bible committed to, 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 to reading it again and again will skip right over this one to get to something more interesting. I'm not going to read the whole thing because I don't want to lose my audience once and for all. But it comes following the, the, the flood and the failed attempt of humanity to, 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 to build the Tower of Babel all the way to heaven, they imagined. It begins with one of Noah's sons, Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arpashad. 
Two years after the flood, and Shem lived after the birth of Arpashad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpashad had lived for 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. And Arpashad lived after the birth of Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. I'll stop there. Mercifully. Let me stop and make a public service announcement to, ever, to anyone who ever served as a lay reader who sometimes has to pronounce these names and places in the Bible. I once had a very conscientious lay reader in my congregation, and he would come by my office when he was reading, and I frustrated him greatly. I don't know why he kept coming by, but he would come by. He wanted to get everything right, and he'd come by and ask me, how do I pronounce a particular name? And I would invariably say to him, I have no idea. <laughs> then he'd take his own stab at it, throw something out there and said, How, how's that? I'm just, yeah, let's go with that. My advice to him and any lay reader, it's the advice I take myself is just read it with confidence and keep going. Nobody else knows what it's supposed to sound like either. But this genealogy with its strange name, it goes on, and you can take this home if you decide to and count it up, but it goes on for hundreds of years, centuries. And in those hundreds of years, there is nothing in the story to indicate that God says anything to anyone. And we know that earlier in the story, God was pretty chatty. <laughs> with everyone. There's nothing to indicate that God creates anything new. Hundreds of years. The story of God in relationship to humanity seems to have come to a close. For creation, we might know this as a time of depression and grief, a dark night of the soul, a deafening silence of God. The staggering good news is that it was in the dark shadows of this place that God spoke and planted. Six words and a comma. Now, the Lord said to Abram. It was in that place of ending that God created a new beginning. It was in that place of dead end God made a way. Now the Lord said to Abram. It was in silence, that deafening silence, and I know that you know what I mean, that God spoke these words of life. Now the Lord said to Abram. It was in this place of deep and crushing darkness that the light burst in. One would have plenty of fodder to make the argument that the, there is no place in the biblical accounting of life that is more important than this one. As you likely know, Jews and Muslims and Christians have all made this their founding story. But this founding story is not gleaned from the moments in which humanity has reached these great heights. This founding story, this transformative story, this life-altering story for the entire planet was born in the depths of darkness. Now the Lord said to Abraham, the authors of this text go to great lengths to drive this point home. That the movement which created a people commissioned to bring light into the world was born in the darkness. 
In the course of this short text, Abram and Sarah are asked to give up everything. Go from your country. Go from your kindred. Go from your father's house. Edgar Moore is a retired pastor who talks about reading this passage, preaching upon this passage hundreds of times before he found something he had never seen before. These are his words. I saw it once and for the first time that God asked Abram and Sarah to lose parts of themselves before they could begin the covenant journey. To give up their homeland, their clan connection, which meant everything in their world. I saw for the first time that they began their journey in grief and in loss. And that grieving and that loss prepared the highway for a new place to travel for the entire world. We begin our service by saying, whoever you are and wherever you are in life's journey, that you're welcome in this place. But friends, we need to go further. It should go something like this. Whoever you are and wherever you are in life's journey, even, no, not even, especially if you are at a place where you are struggling, where you are fighting, where you are clawing and scratching to find some hope. Especially there in that place, you're invited to find a new beginning. And until it comes, we will stand and wait and listen and hope along with you. Because, friends, after all, that is the very place that God plants. It is the very place that God gardens. I have a covenant with you. It's kind of a weird covenant, though, because you don't know about it. <laughs> I covenant with you to never speak with more conviction than I feel. I covenant with you to never speak with more certitude than I have. And I covenant with, covenant with you to never attempt to offer answers where there are only a whole bunch of questions. But this I believe. And I believe it deep in my soul. The, the divine and creating, creating spirit comes to us wherever we are. When we're walking in light, well, when we're walking there, walk for as long as you can. Stay there for as long as you can. But being in God's hands doesn't always mean walking in the light. For sometimes it means walking in the dark and laying claim to the promise that this is the place, this very darkness in which we find ourselves, where new things are born and new paths are discovered. And I know, I know full well that sometimes you will be in too much pain to believe that. And when you are, it will be my job or the person on the right, your right or your left, to remind you. Some days, I'll be in too much pain to believe it myself. And then, you remind me. It's only the second Sunday of Lent and Easter seems far off. But still, I'm reminded of the words of Rachel Held Evans, which I read quite often. And I'll close with them. It's just death and resurrection over and again, day after day, as God reaches down into our deepest graves and with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, pulls us from our pride, our apathy, our fear, our prejudice, our anger, our hurt, and our despair. Most days, I don't know which is harder to believe. That God reanimated the brain functions of a man three days dead? Or that God can bring back to life all the things in our lives and our world that have been killed? Both require great miracles, if you ask me. Miracles. Be heartened 
my friends and family to know that they pop up in the strangest places and perhaps will pop up wherever you are on life's journey. Amen.